Hello, Legion. This is Hadrian. Thank you for being here. Let's play some more of The Long Dark in our Survival School series. So last episode, I asked you guys to give me a little bit of feedback as far as what you would like to see from the future of the series. You responded. I've actually got your comments pulled up on the other monitor so that I can uh, respond, to some, respond to some of them as I go through. Uh, the main thing that I want to focus on with this episode, or maybe the next one if we really can't get to it in this one, because I have a little bit of travel to do and it might, we might find some other trouble along the way, uh, is fishing. Obviously, fishing is the main thing. And I mentioned this in the last episode as something that I knew that I needed to cover and was going to get too soon. So that is probably the next thing. And it's also what was mentioned the most. So fishing is the main response. But I'm also at the top of a slope. And Papa Jendo said this. Also, as obvious as it may be to most players, I would love a quick demonstration of how to walk down a slope or anything without spraining an ankle or a wrist. That was in all caps, so I had to emphasize it. There seems to be a knack to it, like hugging the outside, maybe? Thanks. So, you're right. There is a bit of a, a struggle when it comes to moving down slopes or rapidly and getting sprains. The game, again, mostly does it randomly. Now, right now, this slope is not too bad, so I don't have to worry about it. But when we start moving down very, very steep slopes, which you learn to recognize as you play the Lawn Dark, uh, you actually uh, do run into the problem of, okay, is this too steep for me? What do I do? So one thing you mentioned is actually true, and I kind of do it by habit, and I think you maybe had noticed, and so you included this as part of your question. Just move sideways. Just move sideways so that the direction of your movement is actually not on as steep of a slope. If you're not moving down the steep... Oh, hey, look. If you're not moving down the steepest grade, then you're automatically in a better position. I need to be careful because I'm actually walking into a bear patrol area. Someone pointed out I haven't seen a single bear yet in this series, and... Bears are less common on on, Void, on uh, Voyager. I'm not really sure what to uh, what to tell you, but, but they're just not around. I've got one bullet right now, so if I didn't kill the bear instantly, uh, I'd be having having some fun in the next couple of instants after that. But anyway, so the first thing, yes, is that you go sideways, and we're not really on a slope right now that's that's very dangerous. But let's see if we can get ourselves to one that maybe might induce a sprain. Now, all of that being said, and I've got a few more things to say about how to do this properly, but all of that being said, also, th the game, again, does throw the injuries at you somewhat randomly. And there are things that you can do, such as moving haphazardly down a slope too quickly, uh, to increase the chance, the random number generation chance, that you will be dealt a sprain while moving down a slope. That actually looks like a pretty wicked slope right there. Let's, let's go over there and see what happens. So, this is a slope that, it's usually, the ones that will sprain you the most are the slopes that you can't climb... Hang on, we need to get up to the top of that. The, the slopes that you can't climb on your own. Yeah, this is this is actually not climbable. Speaking of that. So if you were to get if you were to find yourself at the top of an area like this. Oh wait, hang on. We're making it. There we go. Okay, we found a climbable area. Sometimes it's just a matter of butting up against uh, an unclimbable area. I know um, invisible boundaries kind of suck, and you, you hit an unclimbable slope, and the game just kind of stops you. But just strafe around. You know, if you're on the computer, just hit the hit the A and D keys, and uh, and you'll eventually find a spot. So now, if I were to run straight down this slope, I would almost inevitably get a sprain. How are we doing on painkillers? Do I have some on me? I've got twelve. So. See, first of all, you want to try and avoid that. <laughs> Every single impact you just saw was a high risk for a sprain. Now, I managed to avoid it, but there's a couple things you can do to minimize that. First of all, if you crouch, notice what's happening right now. I'm no longer crashing down the side. You can see me kind of taking these lunges forward, but I'm not falling so rapidly. You're kind of crawling down the slope, if you will. So if you want to slow your movement and you want to avoid sprains, by all means, Ouch, that's one thing you can do. Where are we? Okay, there we go. That's roughly where I thought we were. Um, so yeah, crouching is, is the is the other thing I was going to say, in addition to just making sure you pick a good spot at which to um, move down the slope and that you kind of move down, as you pointed out, at an angle. And it is, and I really appreciate you bringing this up as humorously as you brought it up because it is um, a bit of a skill. It's something that you start learning to do automatically once you've had one too many sprains. And so it's the kind of thing that maybe you think about a little bit less because you take it for granted. So it's definitely worth mentioning um, for that. So what else have we got? <laughs> you can do an episode where you use wolves to kill deer. You can do that. That is a 
That is a vicious trick. And it's not something that I've done often, but I do know how to do it. So what that means is that I may not have a chance to actually demonstrate this, but what that means is that you can actually, if you, if you can see that you've got a wolf on you or that you can potentially lure a wolf into following you, you can, if you see a deer nearby that you want, that you want to die or a rabbit for that matter, but a deer is more valuable, right? You basically provoke the wolf, get it to start chasing you, and then run towards the deer as rapidly as possible. Um, now that's a bit of a haphazard way to do it. You could be a little bit more sneaky about it. Um, you could have the wolf already following you and you could come up on a deer in such a way that gives it less of an opportunity to run as far um, to where the wolf detects it faster, etc. cetera. Uh, but after that point, here's some crow feathers. That's worth picking up. Someone told me the other day they've seen as many as eight crow feathers around a body, which is nuts. Evidently, they get higher and higher sometimes um, the longer the game goes, which I haven't seen that as much, but I will take that commenter at his word. Um, and of course, you can experiment on your own. So yes, you, you can definitely use wolves that have started following you as a means of... <laughs> it's really mean, but as a means of killing deer without using a single bullet, which is pretty nice. Or a single arrow, for that matter. All right, I've already looked around in here. I need to drink some of these teas. They're going to help with my thirst and hunger meters, which is quite nice. So I've still got plenty of water on me. I'm actually doing a ride on rest because I just woke up from that nap. So I really, I don't need to hunker down anywhere yet. I guess I can keep moving. I just wanted to stop here and kind of solve my hunger issue a little bit. Speaking of solving hunger issues, uh, we are moving into an interesting area, which I kind of appreciate because as I mentioned in the last episode, uh, there, there's not a lot left to do, but we are kind of running out of food. So you'll get to see a little bit of a glimpse for however many next episodes I record, a little bit of a glimpse of... Um, of just my general reaction to that. And that's not to say that my general reaction needs to be the reaction. And maybe you've seen some things already um, that in a situation where you're like, oh crap, I'm almost out of food or I'm out of food. What do I do? Um, you'll definitely get to see some, uh, some tricks. In Mystery Lake, anyway. A lot of that has to do with, a lot of knowing what to do when you run out of food has to do with knowing the map. Again, when you are new to the Long Dark and you don't know the map and you haven't played the game that much, it's very exhilarating to feel like you're running out of resources and you have that, that real desperation of, I have no idea where to go, I have no idea where the next food's even going to be. Um, so there's that added sense, as I mentioned in the beginning, of exploration on top of the um, discovery of new locations and the discovery of, I'm sorry, the discovery of new food and resources. Yes, you're scavenging, but you're also... When you're playing the early game, you're exploring at the same time because you've never been to these places before. And once you know where you're going, it's a little bit easier to think in terms of, oh, I'm almost out of food. Where do I go? Right. So it's a, ni it's a nice trade off in a way because you, you give up that that uh, exhilarating um, sense of the unknown for a little bit of um for the exhilaration of, of a good strategy, of a good plan, because you know what you need to do. Right now, we're good, though, on all meters. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm peckish. <laughs> I'm very lightly hungry. Another thing I need, frankly, is bullets. Now, I floated in the last episode the, the idea of maybe going into the dam at the end of the series. I'm headed back to the lake right now so that we can fish, because that's one thing that you can do in order to get more food, right? Um, but I floated the idea of going back to the dam, and actually I think the same person that made that suggestion, unless they have a very similar icon to the person that made that suggestion, uh, the person that suggested not going into the dam uh, was was on board with um, with the idea. And in lieu of anyone else commenting on the same thing, uh, which I don't think anyone else has yet, I will... I will plan on that. I will go into the dam in the very last episode so that uh, you don't have to watch... Um, so that there's nothing left in the series. So if you don't want to be spoiled, you can just stop watching there. And I'll give plenty of warning saying, Hey, I'm going to the dam. You've learned all that I'm going to teach you. This is one last thing that we're going to do for fun. 
If you don't want to run it for yourself, don't watch. Something like that, you know. Four hours daylight left. We might be able to get a little bit of fishing in. We've got some tackle on us, right? I think we do. Yeah, we got three. We've got three. So actually, you know what? While I am headed toward the lake to do some fishing, I'm going to keep my head on a swivel. By the way, um, speaking of... I mentioned earlier in the episode, and I'm walking around, and this has occurred to me. Because I remember teaching my girlfriend to play the Lawn Dark, and a lot of the movement that I do um, didn't come as naturally to her because she hadn't spent as much time with keyboard and mouse. Obviously, it's a little bit different on Xbox. Oh, hey, how's it going? Um, obviously, it's a little bit different on Xbox. I've got a bunch of meat down here, don't I? I forgot about that. Uh, but I think it's worth also just briefly talking about how do you how do you move in the Lawn Dark? Like, what, what, what do you do? And, and really, this isn't really limited to the Lawn Dark. This is just keyboard and mouse um, movement control that you kind of improve at the more first person style games you play on the computer. Uh, but it is worth talking about. Or maybe I don't. Did I eat all that food? I guess I did eat all that food. Did I don't see? Oh no, there it is. All right. I was, I was, I was like, I could have sworn that I didn't. Good to know. All right. So this is all raw. How are we doing on wood? I don't think I have, I have any wood in there with which to cook it. So I'm not going to pick it up just yet. We're going to go get some wood first. But um, anyway, so there is a little bit of a trick to how you move when you're using the keyboard and mouse. If you're using the uh, controller, it might be a little bit more intuitive, like how to move in different directions because the controller is kind of made for that. You have a movement direction and a looking direction. But um, with the keyboard and mouse, obviously you're probably using WASD to move around. You've got your W key to move forward, your S key to move back, and then A and D to strafe left and right, like I talked about earlier. But, uh, and then you're using your mouse to look around and W will always take you in the direction your mouse is facing, right? So right now, in order to move a little bit, I'm actually strafing and moving forward at the same time. And one thing I do very often that just kind of takes a little bit of practice is you might notice, you might even hear me, hear the keystrokes when I do this, but if I'm walking one direction and I wanna change direction, uh, the direction I'm looking without changing the direction I'm walking, what I'm doing right now is I just kind of gradually moved as I did that from a forward movement with W to a sideways movement with D to a backward movement with S at the same time that I was moving the mouse. And kind of practicing with that, if you are newer to first-person games, I should have mentioned this much earlier in the series, but it, again, I'm, on, I'm focusing on, on last-minute things that can make you a better player of this game, even if it's minutia, even if it's basics. This, this has been a game that's focused on fundamentals and on, or it's been a series, rather, that's been focused on fundamentals and on mechanics, so I would be remiss not to mention at some point the, um, lots of sticks here, um, the way that movement really works if you're using keyboard and mouse. Again, I feel like it's a, it's a little bit more intuitive to users of a controller, but still worth talking about. All right, so these two limbs should be enough, I think. Let's finish picking these sticks up. Oh, there's another limb back there. Plenty of wood, very good. Oh, there's another stick. Two hours daylight left. These are taking 45 minutes each. Notice the hatchet's condition is dropping. That's something we haven't talked about yet. Wow, still lots of sticks, holy crap. Again, every stick is roughly 10 minutes of flame, so... All right, let's head back down to the uh, office. We're going to pick up all that meat. We're already, we're already carrying a lot of wood, so as you can see, we're moving a little bit slower. A little bit more slowly. And the meat is going to weigh us down even more. But I want to go ahead and cook that meat and have it as a stash. So we are... We're, we're not really in a place, come to think of it, where... Starting to slow me down. I know, it's because you're carrying a bunch of two-pound pieces of meat. Um... So yeah, we're not actually as much in a place. Oh god. <laughs> this is my movement speed right now. <laughs> How uncomfort are we? Holy crap. Alright, so we're almost at the limit. Once you're over twice the limit, you can't move at all. Um, but we're going to be putting all this stuff down very shortly.
So anyway, yeah, uh, we are actually not in a position where we're really worried about food at the moment. But maybe you'll, you'll still get to see some best practices towards the end of the tutorial. We are more in Let's Play mode at this point, but we've got fishing to cover as well as anything else that you guys suggest on top of what you already have. So let's see. I don't have accelerant anymore because I got greedy with that. 70% <laughs> chance of success with a stick or with firewood. So I may as well just, well, I mean, I'm not going to use the fuel. You use up a piece of tinder, you don't use up a piece of fuel when you fail starting a fire. So you can, as long as you have tinder, you can use the same piece of fuel as many times as you'd like if you're failing. Uh, right now we have a 7 out of 10 chance of starting this fire, which is not bad. Not bad at all. Okay, about to hear some happy noises. There we go. All right. Fires can still fail when you hear those happy noises, but your chance is like a 1 in 10. Like it's a very low chance of failing at the last second. All right, let's go ahead and add... You know what? I'm just going to pile this firewood on there. We're going to pile these sticks on there too. We're going to have a nice long fire because reasons. Nice 11-hour fire there, and now we're going to cook. Lots and lots and lots of cooking. We're also going to get some water when all is said and done. Now, cooking does improve the condition of meat as well. So if you find meat that is raw in very bad condition, you can cook it to bring up the condition by a certain amount. I don't know that it's always a 50% improvement or if it is based on proportion. So the lower the condition is of the original item, the raw item, perhaps the condition can't go up quite as much, if you follow me. Again, being proportion-based, it can only improve so much if the starting condition of the meat is below a certain point. But um, I don't know those rules for sure, and even if I did, it's not as important to me in the context of this uh, series that I explained them explicitly. Just knowing that you're there is enough to get you started, and that's what's important to me. So you can consult the comments of this article if you want more specifics, and if someone would be kind enough to offer them, then you can find them there. Hopefully. Fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, so lots and lots of cooking. Still got eight hours of darkness left, or eight hours. Um, we got eight hours on the fire and eight hours of darkness. So this fire is lasting us all night long, and we're probably going to be cooking for most of it. Also getting pretty tired, pretty hungry, pretty thirsty. We still have plenty of water on us, so fixing that problem will not be an issue. Again, we're not losing condition just yet. I know I explained these mechanic mechanics in the beginning, but. I don't worry when I see that icon that I'm going to start dying. I worry when these meters run out. Those are just That's just a warning. When you don't see your condition up on the screen, whatever's down there is not killing you yet. See, now it's killing me. <laughs> All right, so before it drops, let's, uh, let's address that. We've only got two more pieces of meat to cook, which is great. And then I can get some water. Oh, sweet. Level three cooking. We're going to have to take a look at that in a second. Um... This is what happens when you are as diligent about your cooking as I have been in this series so far. Again, I've gone out of my way to cook my teas, um, which I haven't done as much in past Lawn Dark um, content, but since this is a tutorial, I wanted to make sure that we covered that um, as a practice. Uh, you don't have to do it. I mean, I didn't do it, and I think I've done fine for a long time, but um, let's go ahead and heat this reishi tea as well. Somebody was judging me the other day for drinking my antibiotics. Or no, no, they weren't judging me. They were trying not to judge me. <laughs> ah. All right, so let's get that done. And now, all right, we're at level three cooking. I'm really curious what that's what that has given us. Oh, this flare is, I don't know why I'm still carrying this. Derp, drop, don't need that anymore. Let's look at our journal, shall we? Level 3 cooking, plus 15% calories from any cooked food items. No calorie loss when smashing open cans. Oh, that's amazing. And cooking times have been reduced by 10%. Not bad at all. We're at level 2 fire starting. We're almost at level 2 firearm skill, but we don't have that many bullets, and we're not likely to find more if I don't go into the dam, so we're not going to improve that much more. So you'll have to discover on your own play what the benefits of higher firearm skill are. They're pretty cool. I've talked about it, but we haven't seen them. All right, so also one thing I want to note, well, I'll tell you what, let's get some water first so I don't forget. I did cook all the beef. Yes, very good. And then I need to eat ridiculous amounts. Um, 
What was I going to say? There's something important I want to cover just now. It's completely slipped my mind. Come back to it in just a second. Okay. Oh yes, that's what it was. Um, so earlier in the episode, uh, I noticed that the hatchet has been losing condition. We do have some whetstones, okay? Now whetstones, I have two of them. I think I might have more in a cabinet upstairs. I can't quite recall. Uh, but whetstones improve the sharpness of your items to a certain amount. If you let the sharpness of an item go all the way down to zero, it is ruined. You will not get a chance to use it again. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Just be careful. Wow, 920 calories from this deer steak. That's phenomenal. We have so much food now. All right, let's step outside real quick and put this meat back down in nature's freezer. Um, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more in just a moment. I'm just trying to comment on what's happening as it happens. Uh, and there's something else I want to say about nature's freezer. In response to someone that brought up and this is a very good point, and I appreciate this commenter for saying this. I don't have the comment pulled up, so I don't remember who it was. I apologize. But um, in response to the comments about nature's freezer, about this just idea of putting meat down in the snow, canned items actually degrade slower inside. You can't just put anything in the snow. It's the, the things that need to be refrigerated. Cans that are sealed don't need to be refrigerated, right? Once they're open, they do for bacterial growth. But obviously... Meat is a very different situation. That's the kind of thing that works best in the freezer. So just know that. Um, I'm going to go upstairs in the dark here. Hey, dead guy. How's it going? I can barely see you. Walking in the dark. All right, let's sleep for, let's say, nine hours. How about that? And then do a little bit of fishing before the episode ends. Okay, so we're almost fully rested. The nice thing about um, how much we slept is we now have to drink a lot more. We're still encumbered a little bit. What's weighing us down? Is there anything I can drop? I am carrying a lot of sticks. I could drop the simple tools, but I'm not really going to. <laughs> Don't really feel like it. And I'm not carrying any items here that I need to. Well, I can definitely do some repair on some of my clothing. Once you get down to around 80%, there's really no excuse if you have the, the means. There's no excuse for not repairing these things and addressing these problems. Yeah, let's go ahead and repair the jeans too. The cloth is, is one of the things that I can get rid of. Oh, there we go. I knew that was going to happen. The cloth is one of the things I can get rid of to uh, free up a little weight. So... Okay, don't have any more cloth. That's fine. We've got more cloth um, that we can pick up in different areas around the game. So, uh, actually, hang on. Let me take care of something else while I'm here. I'm not sure that really needed it, but I was just going to do it anyway for safety's sake. We're going to drop the jerry can again and then replace it. So yeah, just to show you how this works, we can't repair the survival blow. Survival blow is just going to go away as soon as its condition drops, but we can sharpen using a whetstone. Notice it gave me the choice of which one of my inventory I want to use. We can sharpen a whetstone that way, or <laughs> we can sharpen an axe with a whetstone. Notice the condition of the whetstone went away. There's nothing you can do about that. So uh, higher difficulties where you have to rely on these tools more, <laughs> um, you can find yourself in quite a pickle. If you're not careful. Okay, good. These are cured now. So we can make our pants in the next episode since we already have our boots. All right, let's uh, let's do a little bit of fishing before I end here. I would like to end on that note. So we'll do the basics and then maybe spend a little bit more time about long-term fishing and the associated logistics in the next episode. So we're headed out to the fishing huts. I have everything I need, but you're going to need to pay attention so that you, when I get to the fishing hut and you just watch what I do so that you make sure that when you go to go fish, you're actually carrying with you um, things that they are going to help you get started. There's one thing that I could get that I don't have uh, that would be useful. 
I've got some sticks on me, so I've got enough to go on. But you generally, um, especially if you feel like the weather's going to be bad, you want to bring some fuel with you. All the fishing huts have have uh, fireplaces in them, so take advantage of them. You know, you, you've got um, the ability to... start a fire near you and stay warm while you fish. So grab some fuel and use it. Right now I just have sticks. It's not the best, but um, there you go. Just some general advice. Be warm while you fish. All right, so let's step inside here. Right now we're actually not that cold, so I don't need to worry about a fire. On, on higher difficulties, that would be much more of a worry. So here's the ice fishing hole. Now, if there were a door on this, that would, that's an extra bit of protection that you can do. Not really against the cold, but against predators. Like if there are wolves wandering around outside, you can close the door and be nice and safe in here getting fish. So see, I have what I need. You use any of the tools at your disposal. I'm gonna use the hatchet to break the ice. This of course will lower the condition of the hatchet. We're gonna take a look at how much and there we go. Now the ice fishing hole has been cleared. Notice the hatchet is back down to 46%, so you have to be careful with that. Now, at this point, this is it. You've got your tackle. You don't need to worry about having any kind of bait. You just need to pick hours to fish. How long do you want to spend fishing? And we have about four hours daylight left, so tell you what, let's fish for four. It's going to burn about 450 calories. I have 1149 left, so let's start fishing and see what we can snag. Of course, I read one book, so I'm at level two fishing skill. All right, so we've got a raw lake white fish, 537 calories, almost a five pound fish, not bad. Next, another one, almost a four pound fish. So as you can see, when you don't have bullets and you need extra meat, this can come in quite handy. Okay, another four pound fish, not bad at all. And yes, occasionally you can catch really, really heavy fish. that are very calorie rich and will really help feed you. So let's head back to the office and I'll cut this episode. One thing I was gonna potentially do is just, um, and of course you can always cook the meat right there in the fireplace if you had the, if you had the, the fuel to do it, right? So we'll do a little bit more practice just for funsies and just to, to fill some time in the next uh, couple of episodes, but that's a start. But what I was going to say is one thing I, I was considering doing is I was just going to throw down my, um, just going to throw down my uh, bedroll, that thing. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was going to say poncho. I was going to throw down my, my bedroll uh, in order to save the, uh, the game. No, I don't need to go that way. Am I further out than I thought I was? I'm further out than I thought I was. I always forget how far away the um, the first fishing hut is from the shore here. I know where I am, but just the fog is making life difficult. And in general, there are not wolves that patrol out here, so I'm being quite... Um, okay, here we go. I'm being quite uh, gung-ho in my just sprinting in various directions. Obviously, you want to be a bit more careful just sprinting into the fog. For for evidence of this, look no further than the... Um, uh, the final 10 episodes, I think, of my most recent Against All Odds run. Um, that'll <laughs> that'll teach you not to just go running out into the fog when there could be wolves nearby. It was a fun one where it was it was like a, it was literally a horror episode. It was horror themed because I was just running out into the fog and there were wolves in every direction. I was getting chased. It was fun. It was good times. But yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this one here. In the next one, we're gonna cook those fish. We're gonna do some more fishing, um, and also we're gonna make the uh, deer deer skin uh, pants. We've already got the boots, but we're gonna make the pants. Yeah. Lots of fun. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed this one, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to follow along. New survival, science fiction, and or simulation content airs every single day at 6 p.m. Eastern time on my channel. Comments are always welcome. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time.